myself that when my crew and I hit the road, I would have zero tolerance for internal conflict. I knew that if I couldn't control my own people, there would be a pretty low ceiling to how high I could build my brand. Plus, I understood that there were no minor fights when you're living together on the road. Let's say two guys get into it over a girl. One of them ends up smacking the other in the face. Whoever got touched is going to feel humiliated long after the physical sting subsides. Every time he sees that other guy on the bus, backstage, in the hotel lobby, waiting for a plane, he's going to want to reassert himself. That sort of resentment can boil below the surface until it explodes. And the fallout from a serious enough explosion can take down an entire tour. That's why as soon as G-Unit hit the road, I was very clear on my policy on guys getting into it with each other. I told them we're going to encounter a lot of people who are jealous of our success. If you have some steam you need to let off, fight one of them. I'll have your back no matter what happens. Shit, I'll have your back if you end up punching some random stranger in the face. But if any of you guys fight each other, you're going home the next day, period. For a while, everyone obeyed my idiot. Yes, there were moments when it looked like something might pop off. But I was always quick to remind the would-be combatants, I'm not playing, you're going home if you step to them. Then in the quieter moments, I would pull guys to the side and explain my motives. I wasn't trying to police them, just trying to help them win. We're trying to build something with G-Unit, I say. This tour and the attention it's going to create are going to be the building blocks for something special. But if those blocks keep shifting, whatever we're trying to build will come crashing down. Then we're going to be back on the corner, instead of out here eating lobster and staying in nice hotels and meeting girls in every city. That little pep talk would usually get through to people, and I didn't have to send anyone home. That is, until we got to Philadelphia. The problem started with Michelin Ness, the legendary Philadelphia sports clothing company, sent some complimentary throwback jerseys to our hotel. This was the era when Michelin Ness jerseys were basically the official uniform for hip-hop. Everyone wanted to be seen in one, and some of the rare editions were worth thousands of dollars. Even though the shirts were meant for me, The package ended up in the hands of a guy named Marcus, who was our tour manager. He knew I always buy my own clothes, so he decided to take a couple of the jerseys for himself. He felt that since he was the tour manager, they were some of the spoils he was entitled to. Bangham Smurf didn't see it that way, though. Bangham was someone from Southside that I was considering signing to G-Unit, so I'd taken him on the road to help him get some exposure. Bangham had potential, but he made the mistake of thinking just being on the road meant he already made it. He started drinking his own juice before he proved anything. He didn't have a single. He didn't have any buzz. The girls didn't look at him and say, who's the cute one? To the world, he was just another dude on stage shouting the end of my lines. That experience alone got him so gassed that he thought the rules didn't apply to him. The morning after the Philly show, we were scheduled to get on the bus at 5 a.m. and head to the next city. But instead of my alarm clock, I got an early morning wake up from the sounds of a fight taking place under my window. I pulled back the shades to see an unexpected sight. Marcus and Bangham rolling around in the street, trading blows over a Michelin S jersey. It's mine, I could hear Bangham shouting. Nah, that ain't George, yelled Marcus. You always had a piece of gum stuck on the side. This is mine. Apparently, Bangham had decided one of those jerseys was his. And when Marcus wouldn't hand it over, Bangham was just going to take it. Not what I wanted to deal with at the crack of dawn. I went outside and immediately broke them up. Then I asked Bangham what the hell he was thinking. Nah, Fifth, Bangham started to explain. He's trying to take my shirt. I had to check him. I wasn't trying to hear it. Man, you know I told everyone. No fights from the store. Then I looked at Marcus and said, point to Bangham, get this punk a bus ticket. He's going home. It wasn't until that moment that Bangham realized I wasn't playing. When I said zero tolerance, I meant zero. If you're going to maintain control of your team, You must make people respect the repercussions, even if it means ending a relationship. So Bangham got sent home right then and there. He'd have plenty of time to drink his own juice back in Queens. Bangham thought he was bigger than the crew, but it turned out he didn't know how to move on his own. He started working with some other local rappers, and from time to time would try to get me to support them, but nothing really caught my ear. Without my support, no one wanted to give him a break. Instead of being on the road with me, Making legal money and seeing the world, he eventually caught a case back in Queens. He asked me to bail him out, but I explained to him that wasn't my job. He eventually got deported back to Trinidad, where he was born. To this day, he blames me, 
not himself for his situation. Whenever you find success in life, there will be people who believe some of it belongs to them. Bangham was that sort of person. When you remove them from your life, instead of looking in the mirror, they get angry at you. If I had let Bangham slide with a warning, I would have lost my authority. All the other egos on the tour, and there were plenty of them, would have started the bubble too. Soon, they wouldn't have been fighting over michelin Ness jerseys. They would have been beefing over girls, who got the most time on stage, or who was getting paid what. 